great to have you all, all you watching. And I hand over now to Jamie. Jamie, I give it to you to come and share your story with us. Thanks, Jamie. Good evening. Thank you very much, Alan. I don't know if you've got a bit of an American accent during that introduction there, mate, but it's very kind of you. Thank you very much. Um, it was my dream, actually, to become a professional rugby league player. And more importantly than that, represent my hometown club of Leeds. I've grown up, I was born and bred in uh, West Leeds in Bramley. Um, but before then, just like to say thank you for the invitation. It's always wonderful to share uh, my faith in Christ and uh, my journey walk with God. Um, I, I much prefer to be around people. You know, it's, it tells us early on in the Bible that it's not good for man to be alone. Though we've all come accustomed to virtual meetings and, and Zoom as such, I do much prefer to be around and have that intimate. It's how... Um, in two theatre plays, I, I did a little bit of acting a couple of years ago. Um, as far as I understand, you know, the only the only creatures the only um, the only creatures God created that tell stories are human beings and life's a narrative. Human beings are only animals on planet that tell each other stories in life, entertain, educate, and inspire us. And I thought to myself, um, I, I, I quite like the theatre, and I became um, a board member of the local theatre company, and I ended up in two theatre plays. One was called Playing the Joker, which was about the late great Eddie Waring, who was a BBC commentator. And the other one was called Leeds Lads, which was about the Battle of the Somme. And one of them was um, on the theatre. So he was on stage and it was a very stereotypical method in which to perform. But the other one, the uh, Playing the Joker, was in the round. So when he was acting, he was surrounded by the audience. He was, in a, he was in a community club. He could have been in somebody's front room, any venue that was large enough uh, to to accommodate and it become really clear then that the best part about communication is the actual intimacy about about re being around people. That being said, we have got the advantage of being able to speak to those on the other side of the world. So it's a pleasure to be able to tell my story to you as well. And I'm a rugby league player. And if unless you're from the north of England, you might not know what rugby league is all about. You know, the uh, the vast majority of rugby players would probably be rugby union players, which was the uh, the original game. Uh, rugby league was born out of rugby union in 1895 out of the north, out of um, poverty and rebellion, essentially. I won't go into that. That's uh, time for another day. But as Alan said, I'm an ex-professional rugby league player. I live my boyhood dream. I represented my club for over 22 years. I signed for Leeds as a 15-year-old fanboy way back in 1997. Uh, and 22 years later, 421 games, three Challenge Cup finals, eight grand finals, three league leaders, uh, 144 different players. Later, I retired in September 2019 and went on to continue that journey, representing my club as an assistant coach. Now, I'd love to log on this week and listen to the, the sportsman who's going to give his testimony. And it's interesting listening to uh, people talking about drug addiction I want to throw something a little bit different to you uh, today. Um, you know, drug addiction being one of those things that we um, obviously don't want to be in. And a lot of the stories that you hear when people give the testimonies um, and come to faith are through adversity. Now, there's a couple of reasons you have to bear with me um, why mine's a little bit different because I lived, I lived my boy dream. I fulfilled my boy dream. And when I sit here talking to you now as a 39-year-old retired professional looking back on my career... I have to pin, pinch myself, you know, the uh, journeys that I went on, went on, the things that I achieved, the people, more importantly, that I meant and the lessons that I learned, some of them archetypal lessons that are very directly related to the Bible, and, I, and I, I will come to them. But even though I live that dream and I've got these accolades and I'm not in any way trying to boast, in fact, I'm trying to impress upon you that even that isn't enough to fill that god shape all at the centre of our hearts and minds. Um, and when we look at the things that we try to achieve in life, when we set out um, quite idolatrously at, at a young age, which I'll explain a little bit later on, you know, we can chase things in life. And even when you achieve them, you know, to quote Ecclesiastes, it's absolutely meaningless. It's meaningless without God at the center of it. And that's what I want to try and really impress upon you uh, today. I'm going to start by um, screen sharing. I just want to show you this in pictures because it might give it a little bit of context for those who have not watched Rugby League before. So uh, for those who can see, this is a short video of uh, me playing rugby throughout my career. 
think I'm 13 or 9, 1,000 things in the ninth player to have represented this great club. And I don't think there'll be many players within that time that's played with as many players as I have over the last 20 years as well. It's been wonderful and you know, with all the successes and some of the adversity as well, I think it's the people that you play with that you really treasure. That's where the real gratification and being able to do it in front of my hometown fans in my own city of Leeds is been a dream come true and it's been a real privilege and uh, you know, 20 years in, nearly done, nearly finished, coming to the end of my career, it's been, been a wonderful experience. Jamie Jones once more, through by three, brilliant shot, brilliant try for Jamie Jones Buchanan. Oh, it's inside, and it is Jamie Jones Buchanan. But a short ball to Jamie Jones, Jamie Jones Buchanan for Leeds. It's one of the most uh, popular beards in rugby league. as a player the golden era the golden generation and I've seen all sides of it you know the ups and the downs and you've got to be there for all of it as a lead supporter it'll, uh, I'll never leave them all forsaken and uh, when I do finish I'll go back out and, uh, and stand in that south band so that was a little bit of an insight into my uh, journey you can all still hear me just give me a thumbs up if you can um it's funny, my, my name there, Jamie Jones Buchanan, you might all see JJB, that was the name that the fans give me. So in the world of rugby league, I'm, uh, I'm known as JJB. And the reason being is because I've got the longest name in rugby league. My full name's actually Jamie Daniel Peter Jones Buchanan. My mum wanted me to be called Daniel, it's a nice biblical name. And my dad wanted me to be called Peter, which is another great name as well. And um, so the bandit in the middle, uh, as middle names, Jamie Daniel Peter Jones Buchanan. And why that's a bit crazy, a bit of a funny story, is when I made my debut for Leeds, the kit man, the guy who makes the kit and puts the names on the back of the shirts, said that he couldn't fit Jones Buchanan on the back of the shirt. So in his infinite wisdom, what he did was he put Jones on the home shirt and Buchanan on the away shirt. So casual Leeds fans who were going to games are like going to away games going, who's this Buchanan here? He's worse than that Jones who played last week. We've signed some rubbish this year. But anyway, a bit of a, a daft story. Seven years it took me to get my full name on the uh, back of my shirt. Uh, and when I did, I got my song, but again, that's another story as well. So this is just a bit of an insight in um, uh, some of the trophies that, that we won, went on to win. Uh, and we became known as the golden generation, it might have said in there, uh, the golden decade, because the most successful team in the club's 122 year history. But as I've sat down and, and obviously finished and retired, I've reflected on that career. And usually Alan will have heard me speak before about the adversity that I, I went through during that time. So things like not getting picked for the team, um, horrific injuries, the worst of which kept me out for two years, and, and a whole multitude of other adversity that can surround our, our lives in sport. And uh, uh, I always reached into the Bible as I do in scripture uh, for strength. Christ is, is the center of my foundation of my strength. But some of those stories from Job to Jonah, right through to Christ in Garden of uh, Gethsemane, you know, these, these pictures, these pillars of fortitude and perseverance is where the, the vast majority of the nucleus of my talk came from when I was talking about my career. He's coming. Jesus is coming. I can't wait to hear the trumpet call. He's coming, Jesus is coming, and when he comes we'll crown him Lord of all, and when he comes we'll crown him Lord of all. So at the moment I'm going to hand it over to Bill Ashes. Welcome Bill to our Thank Life you, Stories. Thank you Alan, good evening everybody. Uh, can I just say it's an honour and a privilege to be here tonight sharing a fellowship with each and every one of you and to share the story of uh, my life before and after the Lord Jesus came into my life. And uh, so where do we begin? I suppose we, we begin at the beginning. 
uh, I was born in this little town in the north of England called Wigan. And I was born into a non-Christian family and my mum and dad weren't married and I was the baby of uh, three children, I had four children, I had three sisters, a lot older than me. Uh, my mum couldn't afford much and uh, I think at one time I got embarrassed going to school dressed as a Japanese, Japanese admiral, but again, that's another story. But uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, I had, I had an up and down upbringing. Uh, my mum was a wonderful person, obviously. She was a mum and uh, a strong, strong character. And she looked after us all. She worked all the time. She had a job in the factory. And uh, I had a sad time in my life, which I'll get rid of early doors. And I used to go and stay at my father's at the weekend. And uh, it was a pretty dark time in my life for a number of years. I was abused by my father. And... Uh, and I felt so guilty because of that. I, I, I took all the blame. I didn't, I didn't know how to tell people. I, I was warned by him if I told people. And uh, honestly, it, it was such a sad time. But, you know, even at that time, as a, as a young bloke, he didn't know any difference. Within, what, four or five years of it happening, God came into my life and uh, completely stopped that going on anymore. My sister completely stopped it. And... It's very hard. It's easy to forgive with the Lord, and I have forgiven, but the difficulty is forgetting. And, you know, I need prayer for, to be able to forget that time because there is triggers that, that kick it off, and uh, the devil has a prod and a probe, and, and sometimes uh, he wins a battle by me going into depression. But at the end of the day, praise God, I got over that, and uh, I started to get into sport. In fact, most of my life, until... Meeting Jesus Christ, sport became my God. And I was into football, I was into rugby league, I was into cricket, I was into every sport you could think of. It was an outlet, and I was an angry young man because of what had happened. And as, as Alan shared, which I'll share the number of times that I got sent off on a rugby field, I had so much anger. And uh, a lot of the times as a kid growing up, I took the anger out to other people because I saw the impression of... Uh, the person's face in, in what I was uh, opposed again. But I went to a local uh, junior school and then I went on to a secondary modern school, not like the academies today, they were called secondary modern schools. And I weren't very clever. I weren't very clever at all. I'm not sure in one year that the teacher said, Will, as you are, this other lad, Will, who's the stupidest in class. He said, we'll have to have a, we'll have to have a test between you. So I'm taking this test to give us 20 questions. And at the end of it, he said, Bill, you're the stupidest. And I went, why am I the stupidest? So he said, well, Bill, he said, look, he said, for 19 questions, you've both got everything right. He said, and for the 20th, Bill, I don't know. He said, and you put, neither do I. So again, I weren't that clever enough. I didn't get away with it. You know what I mean? But I was brought in. I was always brought up later on with a sense of humour. And I got into a sport through school, 11 year old, and I started playing rugby league. And at the age of 15, when uh, the day I left school on the Friday evening, I had a job to go to on the Monday. And that night we played a final at Wigan. And during the game, some kid fell on my knee and they took me to hospital. And uh, they told me they couldn't put it in plaster. And from leaving school at four o'clock, I was in a hospital bed with weights on my leg, and I was in that bed for 18 weeks. And believe it or not, I, I grew four and a half inches in 18 weeks. My man went berserk, buy me new pants and everything else. He couldn't afford it. Well, that, that was rugby league. That was a sport. But the best thing that happened, ever happened to me in my life, when I turned 16, I met my wife, Sheila. Absolute diamond. I've been so blessed with that woman. She is she's a dream. She's a wonderful Christian woman. The experiences she's had, uh, which I'll share a little bit later on. It's phenomenal. And I met Sheila at a local dance hall. And it was funny, really. I was only 16. I know I shouldn't have been drinking, but that was the norm then when we were kids. And I was stood at the top of these railings near the bar and I saw this young lady came in and I fancied her straight away. If I could use that word, I don't fancy her. I fancied she was beautiful. So I'm stood at the top and all of a sudden the police walked in. And I got to the 
here in stage and I'm listening, I'm giving it the Wigan. And I heard her say, oh, I'm only, I'm only 17. It, it, if they get me, my mum finds out, she'll go mad. So well, that was my cue. So I just shot down and I went to the side of her and they were coming towards her and I said, listen, Sheila. Well, I, I said, listen, love, I said, if you kiss me, they'll walk straight past you. And that's how I met my wife with a kiss and the police in the same environment. So uh, what, 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 what was that for? For fate. Well, not fate, for luck. Because she, she'd been a rock. She'd been an absolute rock. So I was playing uh, soccer at the time, and I was uh, having trials at Blackburn Rovers. Believe it or not, one of the players in the first team at Black Rovers Island at that time, Terry, was Dave Whelan. And uh, I'd had these couple of trials, and I'd met Brian Dudlus, and I'd met Mike England, and they were great blokes, had a chat, and the manager, Johnny Curry, came over on the Saturday morning after the trial, and he said, I'd like you to come to Blackburn. Well, I was so excited. I, I didn't know what to do. I had no dad. I had, no, I had nobody to help me, nobody to tell me what to do. So I came home. I thought, I'll, I'll, I'll go and have a chat with my sister's husband. Uh, and I was coming home with the news that uh, I could be a professional soccer player. But I was met at the door by Sheila's dad with his news that his daughter was pregnant. So... I gave up football and you know, we got married in February 1966, same year we won the World, the World Cup, 66, uh, in a Catholic church. We proceeded from there to, we had our first child, our Carl, and we had our second child, our Graham, then we had our third child, our Kathleen, uh, and that was in this country. And I was playing soccer for Ince Parish Church. And I came home one evening and I picked up the local newspaper. And a friend of mine who played rugby league with me at school and signed professional terms with Wigan Rugby League Football Club. And uh, whether it be Admir Ad 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 Admiral Tier, admiring what he'd done, or big head in this, I don't know between the two because I thought, I always did, that I was a bit, a bit of a player than Bill. So I thought, I'll give it a go, I'll go and play rugby. Well, I played two games. On only my second game playing rugby league, I was I was I was just turned eighteen. Uh, we played a team, believe it or not, at Adlington, a place called Adlington, another small village up north of England. And we beat them. I think it was about one hundred and thirty-four nil. So I couldn't believe when a scout from Wigan came to me and said, "Listen, young man," he said, "Would you like to come to Wigan?" <laughs> Andy Kirk. Thanks, Andy. Over to you. Thanks, Alan. Um, thanks for that introduction. Yeah, so um, I'll just say I'm, I'm from I'm from the north of England. I'm from Leeds. Um, I'm married now and I've got four children. Um, but yeah, I played professional rugby league for, for 12 years. Um, I mean, you can probably tell by my accent that I'm, 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 I'm a Yorkshire lad. Um, no doubt you've had my good friend on Jamie Jones Buchanan before. Um, so yeah, I played played with Jamie um, at Leeds, and that's where we first met, and and that's where our friendship started. And um, yeah, so just just going into to my story and where it all started, really, it, as a young kid, I, I had a passion for sport from as young as I can remember. Um, I excelled at sport at school. Um, and although I was quite academic, fortunately, um, if if somebody had, had given me the choice, I, I would have done I would have done PE all day, every day at school because I just love sport. And um, I got into rugby league at a really young age. I've got a brother who's a year older, and we both played um, for the local club um, from about the age of six. So um, my dad took us down, and he, he played semi professional himself. So. Um, it ran in the family, but um, so yeah, so so loved sport as a kid, and and, and that was my passion. Um, I also so loved fishing as well, which is something that I still do now, which is fan fantastic. But um, I, I just think it's worth mentioning that I didn't have any any kind of Christian upbringing. Um, I had no Christian faith growing up. My parents never took me to church or spoke to me about Jesus or the Bible. 
but interestingly enough, I, I always remember um, believing in God from a, from, a, from a young age. I remember from the age of about eight years old, I, uh, I, remember, I remember praying, laying on my bed and just talking to God. Um, and I always had a sense that there was there was a higher power there that was that was good and that was looking after me, um, and 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 now I know where that comes from. But at the time, it was I had no context for it, and and I was quite um, not forthcoming with sharing that because because my family weren't um, you know what weren't of faith. Um, but but I always remember that that from being a young age. So just go, growing on and. Um, when I got to the age of 11, um, as a curious young boy, I, I found I found my dad's stash of um, VHS pornography videos. Um, and as a young 11-year-old curious boy, I thought, wow, what, what are these? And, and I started to watch, watch these videos. And um, at first, I was quite shocked um, with what I saw, but... Um, but then, you know, I started to think, wow, this is this is fantastic. I'm, you know, I thought I'm learning all about sex and um, I thought it was a great way. And I thought, you know, my mates don't know about this, don't know about sex. And, you know, I thought I thought it was sort of, um, you know, making me into into a man. And I was seeing things that I shouldn't have been seeing. But um, the reality was it was, you know, it was going to take a, a, a dark twist and a dark turn. But I found myself... Um, after I discovered these pornographic videos, I found myself um, when my parents would go out. I found myself, um, you know, watching them again, um, and I found I just felt drawn to to go back and watch watch the material and search for for different, more explicit material on these on these VHS videos. Any any younger listeners will probably not even know what VHS videos are, but. Um, Obviously, same as like DVDs now, but big clunky, big clunky, chunky things. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, I found myself watching these videos regularly, and by the time I got into my, you know, my late teens, early twenties, I was I was watching pornography as frequently as every day. Um, the reality was that that I was I was addicted at this point, um, but sadly, I didn't know it. Um, nobody had ever told me that you could get addicted to pornography. Nobody had ever told me that it could be a problem. In fact, I remember um, at, at school, at high school, you know, it just seemed normal. All my all my pals spoke about it, and they all seemed to watch it, um, and it all seemed very normal. In fact, when I played at one of my first professional rugby league clubs, I remember one of the um, players brought in. Um, a, a pornography DVD and all the lads were in the players players room in the players lounge and this one of the lads stuck it on and we all sat around and watched it and 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 I, and I say that and I tell that story because that just shows you how how normal pornography was in that environment and how accepted it was um by this stage I'd, I'd signed professional as a professional rugby league player and I was I was I was doing I was doing quite well um, I'd made my way through the academy at Leeds Rhinos um, and into the first team, and then I'd moved on to Salford. Um, so on the surface of it, everything looked rosy. Um, everything looked like you know this this kid's guys, it, it, you know, he's, he's living he's living the dream. He's got everything that that he would want. He's he's he's, he's doing his you know he's, he's playing professional rugby league, something he's wanted to do from being a kid. Um, but actually, the reality was under the surface there was this. Um, pornography addiction that was developing um, even more um, in my life um, to the point where I realised um, I realise now, sorry, but I didn't at the time that it was having a massive effect on, on my uh, relationships on intimate relationships, girlfriends I had, I became very promiscuous um, um, very promiscuous and I was sleeping around, you know, even when I had girlfriends, any opportunity that I got and, and and that was because of the pornography and how it had what it what the pornography had done from from me watching it from such a young age it had, I'd become desensitized and I started to I started to view view women as as, as sexual objects um, rather than rather than people with feelings and emotions 
I began to look at women as as just objects, just to to satisfy to satisfy me and and my desires. Um, and again, sadly, I'd say you know I never even never even crossed my mind that it could have been a problem. Um, so so that was you know going into my late teens, early twenties, and um, at this point, I, I met a guy. Um, who was a physiotherapist and um, his name was Tommy uh, and and Tommy was a, just really struck me when I first met him as just a, an extraordinary bloke really he, um, he he was very open he was he was a Christian born again Christian and he was very open about his faith and I would say I met him when I was around 18 and um, I started to go see him regular because I, if I had had an injury rather than see the club physios, I used to go see Tommy because he, he was so good at what he did. And, um, and, and my relationship with Tommy probably went from eight, being 18 years old to the age of 27. And Tommy would regularly speak to me about, about his faith. He'd share his faith in Jesus. And um, actually one of his, one of his favorite subjects was the end times and, and I remember I was just fascinated with with what with his faith and and what um you know when he talked about Jesus that would Jesus was coming back one day, um and 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 he shared with me his testimony about when he got born again and and how it radically changed him. Life stories. Comes, we'll crown him Lord of all. And when he comes, we'll crown him Lord of all. And when he comes, we'll crown him Lord of all. 